Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about IO async and IO cancelable, two functions that are very useful when you want to lift an asynchronous computation uh, into IO, into a functional effect. But before we go into Scala and IO, I am actually going to show you an example from TypeScript because I feel like this might be more familiar to many of you. So how would we approach something like delaying an execution of, of some code in, in TypeScript or, or JavaScript? Uh, we'd probably use something like set timeout or maybe uh, run an, an HTTP client, something like that. Whatever you do uh, in you know the background uh, from the current thread, uh, it has to be asynchronous. So this was traditionally done by scheduling callbacks. So let's do that. We have the set timeout function in in uh, in JavaScript. It's on the window object, and uh, we can set like uh, we can say run this piece of code in this many milliseconds. So in one thousand milliseconds, in one second, this is going to run. I'm going to log to the console of the world uh, the word hello, uh, and this would work. This is fine, but. Let's say I want to do this again after this part is completed. Uh, so I will do another set timeout. In like two seconds, I want to log uh, the word world. And this is fine. Like this is not really too complex. You can clearly see what's going on. We set one timeout to 1000 milliseconds. We print something. We set another timeout. We print something else. And this is OK. But the problem with this is that this is going to evolve into callback hell if we let it. So why callback hell? It's because uh, these things that we pass to the set timeout function, the first parameter is a callback. This is something that you won't call directly, but something else will call it for you. In this case, it will be the runtime of JavaScript. Uh, so why is this callback hell? Well, because if we keep doing this on and on, this, this, this is nesting so much that you can fit like entire files of code in this indentation. Like there's just so much wasted space. It's really hard to work with it because you will most likely not just have a single line here. You will have some business logic. And when you have just so much of it, it's really, really hard to understand what's going on when you have two or three or five of these. So I'm going to roll back. And I'm going to look for a better alternative to this. So ideally, what we would like to do is something like, you know, like set one timeout and then set another one and expect this to run in sequence. But if I do this, this is not going to behave as I want it to. We will wait one second for the hello world and another two seconds for the world word. So what can we do instead? Like, can I still avoid doing this sort of nesting? I can. And this is what we use a promise for in, in, in JavaScript land. So I'm going to remove this for a moment and I'm going to wrap this whole thing in a promise. So I'll have a new promise uh, of void uh, because I don't expect this to contain any useful value at the end. I just wanted to uh, say when, when it's completed. And in the promise constructor, I will get a function called resolve. Well, I can name it anyway, but uh, it's usually called resolve. And I can set a timeout to just complete this resolve with, with a void. Um, so this will just complete the promise with no useful value at all. And let me assign a value to this. And I'm going to make it a function so that it, it's uh, evaluated uh, later. And I'm also going to parameterize it with the amount of time it has to wait. So millis, which is going to be a number, and I'm going to wait millis. So we have a promise now, and what, what can we do with this? Let's say we want to slip once uh, for a thousand milliseconds, and then uh, we want to... Uh, uh, print the word and then we're going to do another sleep. 
So just sleep of 2000 milliseconds. But the important part, well, like, even though I had to nest this, the rest of the code will not be in the same block. I can do this somewhere else. I can do it here. I can log the, the other word and this will work the exact way I want it to. So in then I can specify another promise in the return in the return value of it. I actually need to return that. Uh, I can return another promise which this this whole thing will wait for then. So this piece of code, when it uh, it will actually start an asynchronous process that will wait a thousand milliseconds, print the word, wait another two thousand milliseconds, and then this part will run. And there's special syntax for that in, in TypeScript, in JavaScript, uh, that we can use. It's called async await, and it makes it much easier to work with code like that. So let's have an example. I can do async await, uh, so I can, I can use it inside an async function. So I'm going to make it an async function, and I'm going to start a block. So I'm going to lift that into the block. And now I don't need all these then. What I can do is replace them with a wait. Then I can just, just log the text and then do another await. And then do the rest. And as it turns out, this is going to do the exact thing I wanted to do from the start. It's going to wait one second, print a word, wait two seconds and print another word in sequence. So there's no, no difficulty in this uh, on uh, how to make sure things run in the correct order. So I think this is really cool, but this is TypeScript and this is promises. Promises are, you know, they correspond to some already running computations most of the time, but this isn't what IO is in Scala. So let's see how we would approach the same problem in Scala. So let's imagine we have the same kind of API. Maybe this is Scala.js or something, uh, but let's, or maybe this is like uh, a web client, uh, an HTTP client that allows us to trigger, uh, you know, to send a request and set a, a request handler that will be called asynchronously, just like a callback. But for, for the purpose of this, it's just a timeout. So we can schedule a task, which is just a plain old Java runnable, uh, to run in this in this amount of time and as a result of this we will get a uh, cancelable which is just a function from nothing to from, from no parameters to unit uh, we are not going to talk about cancelable for a moment yet but we will use it eventually in this video so we have the set timeout and it, it looks pretty much like the set timeout function in javascript uh, so let's try to use it uh, I prepared a, a window main class so that we don't need to care about how the window object is constructed. Uh, so let's just work with it here. Uh, this run function will be called from, from the main, uh, ideally, when I actually enable that. Uh, so let's make it work. And yeah, so I'm going to try to implement the sleep just as we did in TypeScript, except I'm going to do this with I.O. So as it turns out, it's not that hard. I can actually use the IO async function, which looks pretty much like the constructor of promise in TypeScript or JavaScript. And I'm going to specify the type. So in IO async, I'm going to get something very similar to resolve, but we usually call it callback or CB. And this CB is a function from an either of throwable and unit to unit. So we can complete this with a left and a throwable, and that will, that will fail the IO. Or we can complete it with a right of unit, that's unit because I specified it to be unit, and then that will, uh, that will complete the, the IO successfully. So I am going to schedule a timeout using the window object. And my task is going to be callback of write and unit. And I'm going to schedule it for the duration that I was given. So this should work. Now I can write a program just like I would with chaining promises in JavaScript. 
So I'm going to run, I'm going to sleep for one second, and then I can flat map, which is kind of like then, and I will sleep for two seconds. But of course I need the, for completeness, I need the print lines that I had before. So I'm going to flat map to IO print line, hello. Uh, and I need to flat map again. And then after these two seconds of sleeping, I can flat map to another print line. So when I run this, this run uh, IO, it will behave just like the TypeScript code we wrote. But what I don't like about it is that there's still a lot of these flat map, ignoring values and so on. And we can actually make this better very easily. So this pattern, when you when you have an IO and you flat map to something, but you ignore the value of this, the first IO, this is just the right shark operator. So I can replace all of these with the right shark. Uh, it's now included as a method directly on IO. So you don't need to import any, any cat syntax for that in cat's effect. So I'm going to change these couple effects. And it works. So let me just format it more nicely. So yes, so you can actually see that this is pretty much flat now. We just have like these these IOs, these sleeps, these print lines as statements, sort of. And we chain them using the right shark operator. And this would be kind of like a weight in, uh, in JavaScript. But if we had something more complex, something that actually returns values, some IOs that produce any useful results, like something that returns a number, then we, we probably want to use this. We, maybe we want to use it uh, to define how long we are going to sleep. So with async await, uh, we could have just uh, put in some statements, maybe create some uh, some variables, and use them for you know uh, for for other other promises that we create along the way. But in this case, uh, we cannot really use the shark operator anymore because we just we just don't have any value passing that way. So we can go back to flat map. Or we can use other syntax that we have in Scala that's actually quite similar to async await, and that syntax is for comprehensions. So I'm going to create one. So that's how the code would look like in a, for comprehension. And now I can actually keep some of the values. For example, uh, this will be the new duration. And I can use this duration to uh, define the second sleep. And this will work. Uh, but I'm going to revert to the previous version just uh, because it was simpler to understand. OK, uh, so we're back here. now. You can probably see what, what's going on with, with a single set timeout, with IO async, but uh, maybe it would be helpful to show what it all looks like under the hood. So if we tried to expand this piece of code into what it actually does underneath using the window uh, set timeout function and the print line directly, it would look something like this. We would have a single uh, window set timeout in the in the top level in which we would have some sort of runnable we'll set them up for one second and in this runnable we would have this print line i'm just going to copy things uh, and another set timeout this time for two seconds or you know something that comes from computations here and in the second timeout i'm just going to print line world and this is actually equivalent to the run, except it's still not I.O. And we have this parameter 
this callback that we should actually run at the end because let's say we want to convert this to an IO later or maybe do like anything else like uh, we want to run this piece of code and from the caller of this API we want to decide what to do next so we need some sort of way to say hey this is the next step so I'm going to just call call back here and now we can actually convert this back to IO and this is what run2 is supposed to do. So I'm going to do IO async again. I will have this callback and I'm going to call run async with the callback. And of course, this is going to be the callback uh, completed with a write. And that's it. Actually, if I run this and that, the results of run and run2 will be the, the same. They are going to work in the same way. Except there's a huge difference in terms of how we write the code in run and run async. Because in run async, we have this huge chunk of code with a lot of side effects, like at least four breaks, uh, if not five breaks of referential transparency. But in sleep, we only have one side effect, well, one place in which we do side effects. And then in run, we do everything in a purely functional manner. Well, we, we still have to lift our side effects, like synchronous side effects to IO using IO apply or IO delay, but we, we get this functional way of thinking on top of that. And we combine these, these uh, computations using functional operators and we can use them as values. We can pass the sleep to another function and it will keep working. And we don't need to do anything crazy like uh, binary parameters everywhere or callbacks. We can just return IOs and just plug in next steps of execution using the shark operator or a flat map. But there's one more important thing that we forgot about from window. We forgot about this cancelable. So maybe the set so time of the example isn't really that uh, that practical for this but sometimes when you have an asynchronous uh, program you want to do something asynchronously like uh, schedule an HTTP request but under some circumstances you might want to cancel that just disconnect from the connection pool or uh, just close the entire connection to the remote server if we just don't need the result anymore so in that case you might want to cancel such a program and in IO, we have plenty of ways to, to cancel things. For example, we can, uh, we can, let's say we want to do this on the entire run. I'm just going to wrap it in a block. And uh, we could try to timeout. So if I say timeout two seconds, this second sleep will be interrupted. Well, assuming there's no like crazy long race condition, uh, it's going to be interrupted like in the middle of it. So the next step, the print line will never happen. And this actually works right now. We, I don't need to do anything else. I don't need to do any magical, like specific logic to make this async cancelable. That's because if you cancel an async while it's running and before the callback has been run, it will just, the, the callback will be just a no op. The same happens actually if you try to run the callback twice. It, it's just a single run and it will stop working if you cancel the, the IO. So timeout is just one way to cancel things. But what I could also do is maybe run this program in parallel with another one. And if the other one fails, I want to cancel this one because I don't, I no longer need the result of it. So that would be like something uh, like, like the parallel shark operator sort of and maybe another sleep here, uh, wait two seconds, and maybe it will uh, fail with some sort of uh, exception. doesn't really matter, like this can be completely non-deterministic, but still, if this part fails, there's probably no use in running the other one and waiting for the results, so we might as well cancel it. So that's actually how this operator works, and that's actually what async is going to do. It's going to just, just cancel when, uh, just not run the callback at the next steps if it has been canceled. But 
still not running the callback is one thing, but maybe we want to disconnect some things like clean up for from the whole scheduling. So set timeout will schedule something somewhere and maybe creating an HTTP request will also like add a connection and so on. And we don't want to waste that. So maybe there's a way to, you know, sort of hook into the system of IO and say, okay, when this is canceled, also do this. So in window, we get this cancelable from the, the scheduling of a timeout. And we can use this, we can say, okay, IO, when my async is canceled, run this. And I can do it quite easily just by replacing IO async with IO cancelable. Except in this case, uh, the result of this uh, set timeout, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to call it uh, cancel hook to avoid uh, conflicts of naming. And the difference between async and cancelable is that cancelable expects you to return a cancel token in this call, in this uh, this function that you that you pass here. And the cancel token is just an alias for uh, IO of unit. So I'm going to wrap this cancel hook and its execution in IO. And this is it. This is all I had to do. So in case this was something more complex than just a timeout, for example, an HTTP request being started, we might want to stop the request. And this is how you would do it. If you get something out of this function, you can call it in the cleanup. And actually, if you, if you were familiar with React hooks, uh, they have something similar uh, in the use effect hook. Uh, you can provide a way to cancel uh, this, this uh, effect. So that's actually quite interesting. So that's that's how we can cancel the the sleep because we have like atomic blocks of asynchronousness. So each timeout has its own cancel hook, and it, it corresponds to a single I/O cancelable. So this time this can be cancelled, and this can be cancelled. So whenever we stop uh, the, this program during its execution, in either of these blocks, we will just not go further. It, we will just cancel at the nearest point where it's possible. And you can learn more about where it's possible uh, from one of my past talks about interruption. So would that be that easy with just set timeout in this run async function? Not really, because if we wanted to return like something like a window cancelable here, let's assume that we do, and let's use IO cancelable here, and uh, that will be our hook, and we can wrap it in, in this. Uh, so the problem here is that the first timeout is cancelable, but we completely ignore the cancelable of the second timeout. So one way to get this to work is sort of have an atomic reference that holds the information about, you know, it holds the cancelable that is currently active and then when you try to run the like cancel the whole thing it will select the one that's uh, currently active and i can actually do this quite quickly here uh, just to show you how painful it's going to be so let's say we'll help have a cancelable it should be an atomic reference of window.cancelable and i'm going to start with just an empty one just because I have nothing else to do. Um, and I'm going to return a cancelable that takes the value from this reference and, and runs it. And I'm going to set it like cancel one. I'm going to keep that and I'm going to set the value of cancelable to this. And in the second timeout, I'm also going to keep it. And I'm also going to set the, uh, the atomic reference. So you can see where this is going, right? This is going to be very painful to keep track of w which things are cancelable and whether you remember to, to save the, the cancel hook. Uh, so it's very error prone and it's going to be even more so when you have more nesting of these asynchronous callbacks. What is more, we here we have just you know a single asynchronous computation running at the time. We have one timeout, 
and only when it's done, we start the other one. But what if we had multiple concurrent asynchronous computations running? Then we would have to get some complex logic to actually keep all the cancelables, all the cancel hooks in this reference and make sure that we run the correct ones when the whole thing is cancelled. Well, that's what IO already does for you. It will keep track of these cancel, cancelable, uh, you know, cancel hooks or cancel tokens inside of the runtime. So you don't need to worry about keeping track of that. And this is actually what makes it so useful and so nice to use when you have more complex cases than anything like this. So I hope you learned something today. I hope you learned why IO async and IO cancelable are useful, why cancellation is important, and why we should keep it in mind when working with asynchronous concurrent programs. And just the amount of things that IO does for you. So thank you for watching. Uh, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions about this or anything else, or you have suggestions for future videos, feel free to comment. So thanks for watching again, and I'll see you in the next episode.